Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you ask over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you very much for all the amazing questions that you've asked. I really appreciate it. Like I say, most weeks, this whole thing lives and dies uh, by the questions you ask. And... Uh, the better the questions, uh, the better the Q&A. Uh, I get some amazing feedback on the Q&A, but really that's down to the questions that you guys ask. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, I've had a quick flip through. There's a lot of questions this week, which is good. So I'm going to get straight into it. Without further ado, let's go straight into this week's questions. Okay, so the first question is from Adrian Suter, and Adrian says, Hi Craig, thanks for the info on the ring and rope routines. Love to see you perform them. I'm, I'm planning on doing a whole series of performances on classic routines, so look out for that. Uh, generally speaking, performances of well-structured routines with classic props would be ideal. Yep, going to do that. Now the question, can gossip be performed in other languages other than English? Could I adapt it and design my own prop in German based on the gossip principle? I think that the internationalism is an important topic for primarily English-speaking magic community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you buy gas gossip from Alakazam, not only do you get the, the sheets that are designed to look like they've been ripped out of a magazine, right? You get that. You also get two files. One of the files is the gossip sheet. So you can go to a printer and you can print off as many as you want to. The other one is a blank template that you can fill in with whatever it is that you want to. So you get the blank artwork and then you can change it around as you see fit. Um, and you can change it around for celebrities in your country and everything can be changed. So uh, I know I was at Blackpool and I met an amazing magician who showed me that he had, and actually gave me a copy of it, which I've got somewhere, um, that he had uh, put gossip together uh, uh, with Israeli, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. And I know I've seen Spanish ones as well, and uh, I, I'm uh, there's others. Yeah, so you get the blank template, uh, and you can just uh, you know design it for your own language. So yeah, uh, I think that when I spoke to Alakazam, because gossip was the first trick that I bought out after coming back to the magic community. And I remember saying to Pete, you know, uh, Pete Nardi, Alec Azam, you've got to make it so that it's accessible by everybody. So yeah, when you get it, you get a download so that you can uh, adapt it to your own country. So yeah, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, answer is yes. Okay, so the next question is David Blackson. I think you might be a new question asker, in which case, welcome to Magic TV, David. Um, and the question is, how do you organise what must be hundreds of effects in your collection? Um, very good question. Uh, uh, I'm blessed or lucky that I have uh, a massive office with an even bigger warehouse. So a lot of the stage stuff is in the warehouse, compartmentalised into different areas. And in my warehouse, I've got like huge illusions, some of which I've only used once. Like there's... Um, an illusion that we call Entrapment, which was designed specifically for a one-off theatre show that we've used once, one time, one time only. It's a beautiful illusion. Uh, it comes with a set of deceptive steps. It looks absolutely amazing. Uh, there's a fire spiker, the actual fire spiker that Pete Furman used on TV. Um, there's, there's so many different illusions in there, but obviously, as well as the illusions, I've got massive shelves that like go right up to the top of the ceiling and the thing is massive and uh, and all of the stage stuff anything to do with stage is in there and then uh, at home I've got uh, a huge office at the bottom of my garden and another building uh, which is twice as big as the office so I have a lot of stuff in there like I'm I'm in one of those buildings now and I'm looking around and there's literally magic everywhere uh, Sarah likes me to keep magic out of the house. She likes Ryland to keep magic out of the house. We're allowed to have a bit of it in there, but really, you know, we're not allowed to have too much magic in there. I have like seven or eight close-up cases uh, because I like to vary up what I do. So I have like seven or eight close-up cases, lots of uh, lots of bookshelves. So yeah, um, how do I organise it? I'm, I mean, I'll be honest with you, David. I'm not organised. I'm not organised at all. Uh, I did a. Uh, I'll tell you who is organised. My friend Nemid Phoenix. We did a. Um, 
Uh, every week in the metrics for silver and gold member subscribers, we have this thing called the Virtual Magic Club, which is like a live session. It's one hour every week and it's me and a lot of the time I have special guests there. And I had Nemid there the other week and it was amazing. He was teaching his, uh, his version of Thinker Card and just giving advice on gigging and sleight of hand. It was incredible. The session ended up running almost two hours, as I expected it would. Um, but he talked about how organised he is with his magic collection and it's just insane like it's absolutely insane if you want to know how to be organized <laughs> go join the netflix go join the silver level and have a look in the virtual magic club because they're all recorded so you can go back and look at them go and look at that and then it breaks down how he actually um uh, keeps his magic stored and, and keeps it organized it's just ridiculous i'm constantly looking around for stuff i mean Oh, I can't find it. Where is it? I've lost this. I've lost that. I lost the other. I know where my most important stuff is, but I tend to lose a lot of stuff as well. So I'm not organised, uh, especially as I have so much magic between me and Ryland. But I try to keep it organised. Okay, so the next question is Andre H. And Andre says, Hi, Craig. How do you go about practising and rehearsing magic, especially your stage-type routines? And when do you know when your new effect is ready to incorporate into your show? Um, good question. How do you go about practicing uh, and rehearsing magic? Here's the big piece of advice I can give you. And I work with uh, a lot of people in the gold level of Netflix. And every two weeks I have a session with them over Zoom. And I was doing a session with one of them a couple of days ago. And this question came up or, or, or a similar question came up. And I'll say the same thing to you that I said to them, which is, when you're practicing a stage routine, right, um, you get it to a point where you think it's ready. And then when you think it's ready, you have to actually rehearse that trick in front of a camera. OK, uh, you have to practice it and, uh, because you can have in your head the greatest stage routine of all time. But until you actually see what it looks like from an audience's point of view, you don't know for sure. So, for example, uh, and I think I told this story a couple of years ago, but I'll tell it again. Uh, I had an idea. If you've ever seen Greg Wilson's uh, opener when he does cabaret a lot of the time, he does this thing where he has a flat brown paper bag and he pulls it out of his pocket and he says, hey, it's party time. Uh, I've got inside this bag everything you need for a party. He opens it up. There's a party hat. There's party hoppers, poppers. He brings out all this stuff. And then he brings out a beer and he says, the last thing you need is beer. And he brings out a bottle of beer. And it's basically a bottle production. Very clever, very clever. And I was like, you know what? I could do that in my illusion show. And I had the idea of having a crystal casket, showing the crystal casket so it's completely empty, throwing a cloth over it and talking about how we're going to get the party started. We, never, we need everything we need for a party. Reaching in, getting party banners, getting party hats, getting blowers, party poppers, reaching in, getting a full pint of beer, all this stuff. And, and then the final thing would be, and one other thing you need for a party is girls and pulling off the cloth and the, uh, the assistant there. And I, I went and spent probably 30 quid on party stuff from a shop, from a party supply shop. And we've spent probably seven or eight hours rehearsing it over and over again. And I filmed it and I looked back at it and I was like, this is just awful. It's the worst trick ever. And I couldn't tell. I didn't realize until I watched it. And then when I watched it, I was like, we just need to bin this. This is just completely irreversibly bad. And, and that's the problem. And a lot of the time when you're performing on stage um, and you're rehearsing stuff, you need to perform it in front of camera. But what you need to do is you need to rehearse it and you have to really visualise that you're on stage. And Mark Oberon talked about this when I interviewed Mark Oberon for Magic TV. You can go back and watch that on the Talk Magic interviews. And he talked about... Um, uh, uh, he talks about uh, when he rehearsed for Fissa and he would stand there rehearsing his act over and over again. And he would imagine the theatre in front of him and he'd even imagine individual people. Uh, and that's what really helped him. So, yeah, the big piece of advice I can give you when you're performing on stage and you're putting a routine on stage together is theoretical is fine. But at some point you need to rehearse that in front of the camera and you need to rehearse it again and again and again. Because unlike close up with a stage routine, you see, with a close-up trick, you've got to practice the sleight of hand and you've got to practice the moves and so on and so forth, right? So if you're practicing ambitious card, it's like, right, the card comes to the top of the deck and you might practice the script or whatever it is that you're doing. With a stage routine, you don't just have to practice all of the sleight of hand and the script and the moves and all of that sort of stuff. 
you also have to kind of work out where everything is, else it's going to get really messy. I've seen so many acts on stage that are good, they're well scripted, the magic is good, but they look completely disorganised. And one of the reasons they look completely disorganised is they've obviously never done a dress rehearsal and they don't know where stuff is. It's like, I need a pen. Um, has anyone got a pen? Where's the pen? I, I, I remember seeing this, um, this one act and it was a, you know, it was a well scripted act. The magic was good. But um, what, was, what was not good about it is it was obvious that the person that was doing the act hadn't put any rehearsal time in at all in terms of standing in front of a audience or or pretending that it was standing in front of an audience and actually blocking and staging everything and working out where the props are and where he was going to stand so he did a routine where uh, there was a prediction inside a blown up balloon uh when i was watching the show and he he was in this situation where obviously he had something palmed and he was holding the balloon and he needed the spectator to pop it uh, and and he realised in the middle of the performance, as he was performing, he, the spectator needed a pin. He's like, can you go and get my pin? It's in the case. Oh, no, don't get... And then he realised there was a prop in there. No, no, don't get that. Has anyone got a pin I can borrow? And then he was trying to get somebody to pop it with a with a, with a a um, a key and then a, a pen. And it was literally five minutes of excruciating agony watching him hold this, unable to get somebody to pop it. And eventually it was a lighter. And the problem is he was standing right next to the wings. So when it popped, whatever was meant to be in there flew out into the wings and he had to go out into the wings to get it, to bring it back. And, and, and it, he could have literally just switched an elephant at that point. Right. Um, so that was a good act that was magically sound that was scripted well, but because of the lack of rehearsal, um, and uh, when it comes to staging and blocking and so on and so forth, it just looked very under rehearsed and it looked amateur. So, in order to go back to your original question, how do you go around um, practicing and rehearsing stage magic, and how do you know when effects ready? You f you go and perform it. I you know what when I first put my stage show together, I hired a function room, and I just literally set up the stage and I performed it again and again and again, all day, every day for a week. I went in there every single day for a week, and I was just rehearsing, filming, looking at it back, filming, looking at it back filming, looking at it back. And I just did that for a whole week until I got it into a position where I felt it was ready. And then I went and did it in front of a real audience. And every single time I put a new routine into my show, I do exactly the same thing because that's the way that I know that the routine in question is going to do well. So yeah, the big piece of advice I can give you when it comes to rehearsal is actually do a full dress rehearsal. If you're dressed in a particular outfit, wear that outfit because everything can affect the performance. And you don't want to find out about it in front of a real audience. You want to find out about it before you end up in front of that audience. So the next question is by Mentalism Monday. How are you doing Mentalism Monday? And the question is, what's your favorite magic book? Well, that is a very easy one to answer. It's Rune's World by Rune Klan. Uh, I am a massive, massive, huge, massive fan of Rune Klan. If you haven't seen Rune's act, you want to go and check it out. Rune is absolutely amazing. I first became aware of his work when I got a very old VHS tape, which has now been re-rendered as a DVD and perhaps even a download that you can get from Vanishing Ink. And it was called Three Pieces of Silver. And it was Rune's routines with three regular coins, no extras, no gimmicks. And I learned every single routine. And then off the back of that, um, I just devoured all of his material, Impromptu Hitman, which was the routine that would eventually um, become um, sort of the Sharpie act that Rick Merrill used to um, win Fissum. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it, Impromptu Hitman was, was Rune's thing that it was based on. Uh, and, but outside of that, Rune is a hilarious performer as well. Uh, on stage, like absolutely hilarious. The guy just can do everything and he can do it brilliantly. So yeah, I'm a huge Rune Klein fan and um, uh, his book Rune's World, which I believe has just been reprinted by Vanishing Ink, possibly. You won't want to check that out with them. But I love, uh, I love Rune Klein and his book uh, Rune's World is, in my opinion, the best book, the best magic book I own, just because I'm so high on Rune Klein. 
And the next question is from Sean Garf, and Sean says, hey, Sean, by the way, hope you're well. Hey, Craig, thanks very much for answering my questions. You might have already answered this question before. If so, skip over it. Don't think I have, actually. My question for this week is, what is your all-time favourite Penguin Live, apart from your own amazing one, of course? There's some incredible ones, aren't there, really? So many really good uh, Penguin Lives. I think my favourite one of all time, and I've mentioned this before, is G. G's Penguin Live is absolutely brilliant. There's so much commercial material in there. I love, I love, I love G's Penguin Live. It's really, really good. Um, trying to think of others that I like. Uh, I mean, I like all of them. I tell you what, the um, the Mike Gallo one that's only recently dropped, really like the Mike Gallo one. He was doing some incredible coin magic on there. If you're a fan of coin magic, and I know you're learning coin magic on the Netrix, Sean, uh, Mike Gallo's... Uh, yeah, Mike Gallo's Penguin Live was really, really good. Um, trying to think. Uh, Eric Tate's Penguin Live is brilliant as well. I'm a massive, massive Eric Tate fan. So if you haven't got, uh, if you haven't checked out Eric Tate's, please check it out. And if you like strong routines that are kind of more geared towards parlor or stage, but will also work close up, um, a very underrated Penguin Live that I think is very good is John Archer's Penguin Live. His um, uh, handling of uh, the Magic Square is how I do the Magic Square in my show. And I learned that from his Penguin Live. So there's some really good stuff on his Penguin Live. It's well worth checking that out. So yeah, great question. Uh, I'd say first of all, G. Also check out Eric Tate and check out John Archer. There's probably a million others. We have to do a video on the top 10 best Penguin Lives of all time. So the next question is by Sean McNulty, Magician, and Sean says, after seeing the Virtual Magic Club on Netflix, I now have a friction pen. Boom, good job, my man. Uh, where's the best place to check out tricks that use friction pen? I've got an absolute ton of them. I was gonna um, produce a, a project on the friction pen many, many years ago, but I never did. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a search because I know there's a project. I've not seen it myself, but everyone talks highly of it. Uh, got it. Right, here we go. Okay, so there is... Okay, so I don't know if you know Jeff Stone. Uh, there we go. So uh, this was years ago. This is a PDF that you can get from library.com. So L-Y-B-R-A-Y, library.com. Uh, there is... This was uh, released in 2009. Uh, the third edition was released in 2010, 96 pages. It's by uh, Jeff Stone, and it's called Friction Fire. This is currently the most complete and thorough work on the use of friction pens. Uh, there you go, with the coming friction, now's the time to ride the wave. Uh, Stone Friction Fire is the most comprehensive study of this fascinating new tool for magicians. This ebook covers every aspect of the friction pen imaginable, from simple things where you can get them to how to conceal their use in the audience, to things you can't even imagine. For just a couple of bucks at a stationery store, you can purchase a tool that will revolutionise your magic. Um, okay, imagine a drawing on a piece of paper comes to life, literally, turning a picture of money into the real thing, visually, with no sleight of hand. Picture of a scrambled cube that can be examined, solves itself, no switches, the spectator can keep it, over 20 effects. Um, so there you go. That is, as far as I'm, I'm aware, the definitive guide to friction pens. I don't think anybody else has done anything on friction pens. I know Alan Rorison had some work on the friction pen, obviously, because you're in the... Um, uh, the Virtual Magic Club on Netflix, you've seen that I've got quite a lot of stuff on the friction pen. In fact, let me know if you want me to do a... I mean, obviously, I just start... The the the, uh, the the Virtual Magic Club was all about business card magic, wasn't it? I kind of you know, deviated into friction pen stuff because I do a lot of it on the back of business cards. Uh, let me know, either here or in the community on the Netflix, if you want me to do a, um, a session on the Netflix just on friction pens and kind of go into more depth and stuff that I do... Let me know and uh, we can organise that in the next two to three weeks. Okay, so the next question is David Makin and David says, uh, when is the new version of Keymaster going to be out? So I'm checking Penguin. Uh, I'm checking Penguin uh, every two seconds. I'm excited about it. I need you to help me with this addiction. Uh, it's coming soon, I believe. I think it's the next thing Penguin have bought out. Obviously, they bought Chop Out first of all, uh, which was the first thing and that's uh, been an incredible seller uh, for Penguin. I know they're very happy with it. I think Keymaster is the next thing that they're bringing out. So they're bringing out Chop and then they're bringing out Keymaster. 
Uh, I cannot wait for you to see the routines with Keymaster. It was the biggest project that I filmed when I was over in Penguin. Uh, it was a mammoth project, like I'm talking ridiculous. And there's so many different routines on there with absolutely everything. The ring and string routine using the key and the string is, in my opinion, worth the price of the project alone. But there's so much more that you can do with it. So yeah, it's, it's coming soon, I believe. I, and they haven't told me, but I think that they might be having a soft launch at Magic Live. I don't know. We'll find out. I, I, can, I can imagine that they are. Um, but yeah, it's, it's coming soon. It's going to be well worth the wait. Okay, so the next question is from Mikey Anno. And Mike says, any opinion or reviews of Peter Egging's new trick, Focus? No, I, I've only just found out about it, man. I, I know nothing about it. I will be ordering it. I think it's up for pre-sale. Uh, now, I uh, did the podcast with Lloyd on Wednesday and we talked about it. And he's just got a new thing coming out with Illusionist as well. So he's got two. It's a little bit like a bus, isn't it? You wait absolutely ages for a Peter Agging trick and then two come along at the same time. I don't know about it. I'm going to get it. I will review it. I really hope, I really, really hope um, that Peter uh, pulls himself out of the slump he's been in for the last couple of years. Because I've said it before, he's an incredible creator. Some of the stuff he's released years ago was brilliant and it's kind of gone a bit downhill over the last two years but uh you know i'm rooting for him i really hope this is a good one but i'll find out i'll find out when i get it okay so the next question is from arthur newman and arthur says can you do a review of medusa uh please the medusa project i have i have i did a full review show special on orion productions if you just type in to youtube magic tv orion productions medusa you'll see that I did a full review show special on the whole of their range, including the Medusa project. And I did a performance and I did a review. So yeah, it's on there. It's on YouTube. It's an amazing project. There's so much you can do. And I went in real depth about it. So yes, I've done it. It's there. Just search on YouTube and you'll find it. Okay, so the next question is from Zach Magic Israel. And Zach Magic says, uh, Shalom, Craig, Shalom. Uh, speaking of Memdex stacks, what do you think of Wayne Goodman's Prism stack? I think it's fantastic and really easy. Uh, I like it, man. Uh, I, I, Wayne showed me last time I was at Alakazam. Uh, I wouldn't use it because it's, uh, I don't need to, because I've memorized the deck of cards. Uh, I think it's an incredible way to very easily know the position of a card um, without needing to memorize a deck. And I believe that's what it does from memory um somebody says a card and you know what position it's at i think that's what it was isn't it uh somebody names a card and you know what position it's at or somebody names a number and you know what i don't think it's both ways so and i can't remember because he only showed it me briefly but it was either somebody names a number and you know what the card is at that number or somebody names an uh a number and the car i think it's that one somebody names a number and you know what the card is at the number which is a very clever way. It's come up with a very clever way of doing that that uses very basic mathematics instead of memory work. The problem is, for a lot of the stuff that I do with a mem deck, I need instant recall. So I need it going both ways. So in other words, uh, I want to I wanna hear the King of Hearts and I know that's, that's a position 35. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to do memory work. I know it's a position number 35. Um, if I hear 22... I know it's the eight of spades. I just know. And I know next to it at 21 is the three of spades. Uh, and I know at 23 it's the six of hearts. And I know at 24 it's the ten of clubs. And then it's 25 is the five of diamonds. Then the king of diamonds. And so on and so forth. And then the two of clubs. So on and so forth. So I've got instant recall. And instant recall is always instant recall both ways. So knowing the, hearing the number and knowing the card. Hearing the card and knowing the number. Instant recall is always going to trump uh, a, a mathematically based stack because I can just do it immediately. I don't have to worry about it. I just know every card that's at every number. I know every number that's every card. Um, and there's no substitute for that. So although I think it's very clever, and it is very clever, and for people that just can't memorize the deck, it's a viable alternative. Um, for me, uh, the mem deck is the way to go. And also, um, the thing with the mem deck is it looks completely and thoroughly mixed, because it is mixed. In essence, you could take a shuffle deck of cards completely shuffle it and learn it and that's a mem deck you know so um I, I i think it's good but i think learning a mem deck is better which is why i bought out forecast okay so we've got another question from zach magic israel and he says uh i'm still on the fence with lux what are the mentalism applications and the parlor stage applications for it um 
So mental, well, parlour for I haven't really given it any thought when it comes to a parlour situation. I haven't really given any thought at all to it uh, from a parlour point of view. I think it would work in a parlour trick as long as it was lit correctly because you'd want the audience to see it. I think somewhere like Smoke and Mirrors where it's a darker theatre and you get them to hold their hand out or whatever it is that you're doing, I think would work quite well. Um, but mentalism applications, there's a ton of mentalism applications for it. Um, I mean, an absolute ton. You need to watch the tutorial. But I mean, uh, off the top of my head, a couple of mentalism applications is every single deck of cards that you have, you can very quickly just throw an X on each card. And now using alternating mode, uh, and I did a performance of this on the map test uh, that went out on Thursday. But using uh, alternating mode, you can literally have somebody name a card. They can go through every single card in the deck and see that there's no cross on it. And then the card that they named, they look at it, and it's the only one with a UV cross. I mean, it's incredible. Um, Lloyd's got some really great mentalism reveals with it as well, where you can do mentalism reveals. There's um, uh, a great book test on there where, uh, where they've taken a book and they've put a UV mark around every single uh, uh, page number. So somebody names a page number and you go through and you show that none of the other page numbers have got circles on them. And the only one that's been circled with a UV pen is, is the page that they named. And the reason for using a UV pen is you say to the audience, look, I've, I've written a circle uh, around one of these numbers in this book. Now I've done it in UV ink, so you don't know which page has been circled, but one page has been circled with a UV mark. You're gonna try and figure out which one it is. It totally makes sense, right? And I think that's part of the thing with Lux. You just need to uh, establish a reason for using ultraviolet light. And as long as you establish a reason for using ultraviolet light, then it's totally not a problem. Um, I saw, me and Lloyd were talking on the podcast about a uh, application of it that somebody talked about on the, um, uh, that somebody talked about on the uh, on on the group on the Facebook group, which is absolutely genius. So uh, let's say that you have three cards, and they're blank on both sides, and they've all got crosses on them. Okay, uh, but you say to the audience, you have three volunteers, and you say, look, I'm going to turn my back. I've got three blank cards here. One of them has been marked with a big cross with UV uh, ink. Now, obviously, you don't know which one's which. I want to mix them up and decide on which person gets which card. And I want one of you, uh, I want you guys to work out who's got the card with the cross on it. But don't tell me, I'll turn my back round. Now, you've got luck set up in alternating mode. So what you do is uh, you give the pen to the first person. They switch it on. And obviously, no X will show up on the card. Um, because that's how alternating mode works. He then switches it off, hands it to the second person. Second person switches it on because of alternating mode. They will see an X. And then you switch it off and hand it to the third person. Third person. They won't see an X. So now you know, even though your back's turned, you can even be out of the room, you immediately know which person has got the marked uh, UV, um, uh, the marked card with the UV on. So you can do a living dead test or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Lloyd was also talking to me about uh, a Darren Brown trick. Darren Brown actually did a trick years ago where he had like 20 blank cards that were just completely blank. And he said to the spectator, one of them's been marked with a, uh, with a, with a, a cross in UV ink. You get to work out which one. Uh, and, oh no, one of them's marked in a very special way and they can pick any one. And when they, when they look at it, uh, it's got pick me on it in UV ink and the other ones haven't. Uh, and you can you can achieve that exact same thing with 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 um, with Lux. So there's a lot of mentalism applications, and and people are coming up with new ideas for it all the time. I think it's just a genius principle. I think that there's I know that Lloyd is more excited about the mentalism applications than he is about the magical applications, and I can totally see why. I was with Louis Lavelle filming for the 1914 a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about Lux, and he was talking about all the mentalism applications and how he's going to be using it in so many different ways. So, yeah, there's a lot of mentalism that you can do with it, an awful lot, and I think that the best tricks from a mentalism point of view haven't even been considered yet. So, um, yeah, there you go. Okay, here we go. The next question is for the Trunk Magic ukulele player. This is always interesting. Uh, good afternoon, Craig. Great videos as always. Having dabbled in coin magic, I decided to treat myself and buy a flipper. Imagine my surprise when I was delivered a full-size adult dolphin. As much as I like the 1960s TV program and the 1990s movie, which made me cry, 
I really don't have the pocket space for it. However, I do have a three meter pond, which I can get him if I bend him in a curve. Get him in if I bend him in a curve. Do you think I should face him east or west? If I faced him east, he'll be facing the sea and he might get depressed. Also, I'm a little concerned about blowing one off and getting my neighbours wet. Any advice would be much appreciated. You know what, man? I, I, I don't think you wanted this dolphin in the first place. I think you're after coin. You got to live with a dolphin. I think that you could keep him in your pond. And if you did leave him in the pond, I would head him, um, I, I would head him uh, east because at least then he's seeing the sea. I don't think he'd get depressed. I think he'd have fond memories. But in reality, I'd just set him free. I'd just, I'd just take him to the ocean and just set him free because at the end of the day, uh, you can you can you can survive without having your pet dolphin, and you can. Uh, but uh, you know, I think that the dolphin would be better than just being set free. Um, that that's what I think. Hope that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Sean Andrzejczak, and Sean says, "Question: I know you and most other professional magicians stress the importance of giving proper credit to others when bringing out a new project. What resources are there to do research to see if my slight is original or if somebody else has published my trick, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, I mean, you want to surround yourself by people who are very, very knowledgeable. And this is one of the reasons why it's good to go with a company when you're releasing products. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, you go with somewhere like uh, Peter Nardi, uh, Alex Zam or, you know, Murphy's or, or Penguin or uh, 1914. They will do their due diligence for you. Now, it's important that you've done your due diligence beforehand, but they will then do their own due diligence as well. So, for example, when I was bringing out... Uh, the visible project with the 1914. Uh, I think there's 13 routines on the project. There were going to be 14. We actually filmed 14 routines. One of the routines, and when Dee had filmed it all, he sent it out to several people who are very, very knowledgeable, as Dee already always does. And one person said, hang on a minute, this is a little bit similar to this. And we did some looking into it and we checked it out. And it was a little bit similar to one other person that I never knew about. I didn't, hadn't seen this, didn't know uh, anyone I'd shown it to, hadn't seen this either. And so we just pulled that one particular effect. Now, it didn't affect the project because there were still 13 routines on there. But that was picked up by D and his team at the 1914. Now, I always do my own research as well. And it's very important to do your own research and, and, and make sure that you are absolutely completely and totally hyper aware of what's been out and what's not been out before and so on and so forth and you want to have like i say a good team around you like i i, I have several times in the past reached out to michael close and i've asked him to look at something and get his opinion on something um i but i've got lots of magic lloyd is my go-to guy lloyd and nemid are my two go-to guys because both of them are very 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 knowledgeable um, in completely different ways. Obviously, Lloyd working at Murphy's, he's seen an awful lot, and, and Nemed is one of the most well-read, most well-researched magicians I've ever met. So both of those guys will go, oh, hang on a minute, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? Have you looked at the other? Um, so you do your own research, and, and there's, um, there's, there's places online that you can look at as well. The Conjuring Archive is somewhere that you can check. Um, you know, you can you can you can do your research online. The Genie Forum, the Magic Cafe is a good place to check this sort of stuff as well. Um, you know, there's lots of different places that you can actually get paid subscriptions for as well if you want to. Uh, but ultimately, at least when you're first starting, my advice is to work with the company as well because they'll do their element of research for you over and above what you were doing yourself. Um, but you know, it's it's. <laughs> something always falls through the cracks. Something always, always, always falls through the cracks. So a lot of the time, um, you know, you, you, you try your absolute best and you research and you research and you research. Um, but, you know, sometimes you'll just, you'll, especially if it's something. So, for example, I'm not going to say who, but uh, about four months before Lux got released, when new, nobody knew what Lux was, the hype hadn't started. There were like literally about five people who knew what Lux was, and I had my Lux. Um, I, ha I got contacted by a very well-known magician. Uh, and when we were chatting about a whole bunch of different stuff, and one of the things that we ended up talking about was a project that he was considering starting. And he said, I've got this idea. And he described to me exactly what Lux is. And I said, stop right there. Go speak to Lloyd Barnes um, because it's been done. 
you know, you need to go and speak to Lloyd. Um, but, you know, I was probably one of the only people that he could speak to that would know about that project at that point. So you never know what's in the works with various different people. You have to do the best you can do, and that's all you can do. But work with the company, show it to as many people as possible, then you're normally fairly safe. Okay, so I've got another, uh, another uh, question now from Mentalism Monday. Uh, Mentalism Monday says, what's your favourite mentalism effect that would work on stage? Well, my favourite mentalism effect that works on stage, in all honesty, is Tossed Out Deck. I love Tossed Out Deck. I've always loved Tossed Out Deck, specifically the Wayne Dobson version of the Tossed Out Deck. If you don't know the difference, the, the Wayne Dobson version of the Tossed Out Deck is, uh, rather than doing the traditional method where everybody sits down at the same time and you get one big round of applause, uh, it's scripted and engineered and choreographed and routined so that eat, uh, so if you're doing it to four people, you're getting a round of applause from each person. So the so the applause builds and you get a better reaction. But uh, toss that deck is absolutely amazing. I'm a huge fan of toss that deck. The other thing that I really like is the um, is it the ultimate prediction? I think it's the ultimate prediction. I can't remember. It's uh, something prediction by Cody Fisher. It's this thing where you throw three paper balls out into the audience. And uh, they grab the paper balls and you ask them a question. Do you want to, uh, you know, do you want a, uh, do, you, do you want a, uh, what suit do you want? Uh, what value of card do you want? Do you want it face up or face down? And you're asking all these questions. And then you take this deck that's been here the whole time and you show that one card's turned over and it's the card they named. But then they all come up on stage and hold their pieces of paper open. And when they do, they, their pieces of paper say the name of their card as well. It's in killer prediction. That's it. Killer prediction by Cody Fisher, it's amazing. And I've actually done a big stage version of that where I've actually used T-shirts instead of balled up pieces of paper. And I've used the T-shirt gun, which is an incredible way of doing it. Uh, but yeah, those two routines, I would say my two favorite routines to do on stage. Uh, I always bring the house down when I do those. So the next question is Simon Belducci one. And Simon Belducci one says, don't you think it's an issue that if somebody Googles tricks with UV, they see a whole bunch of stuff coming up about Lux. Don't you think that this makes Lux something that people shouldn't buy? No. And and I'll tell you for why. It's a good question, but I'll tell you for why. If you Google most of the stuff that people see, you're going to see a tutorial for it. So let's just say you do ambitious card. Okay, and I'm opening up an incognito window here. What would somebody search for if they've just seen an ambitious card? They'd probably go card comes uh, card comes up to the top of the deck. Boom, card comes up to the top of the deck. And we've got four videos about the ambitious card. Then we've got uh, links through to uh, ambitious card. Uh, yeah, okay, so basically the first page of Google is videos, tutorials, and links to the ambitious card. Doesn't stop people doing the ambitious card, right? Let's do another one. Coins jump from hand to hand. Let's say somebody's watched the coins cross. Coins jump from hand to hand. Okay, so again, we've got five or six, uh, uh, we've got five or six videos, full tutorials on coins across. Then you've got uh, performances of cards across. Then you've got links through to expanded shells. Uh, and then we've got a link to Vanishing Ink, which is a blog called Easy Magic Tricks with Coins. And it's a whole bunch of stuff on how to make coins appear, how to make coins disappear. Um, so, yeah, so, so that one is covered. Is there anything else that we can think of that somebody might search for? Uh, okay. Okay. In the UK, a lot of people do Omni Deck. Uh, so we'll do turning deck of cards into glass block. There we go, turning deck of cards into glass block. And the first stuff that comes out is a uh, tutorial on how to uh, do the Omni Deck. Then after that, you've got five links to magic shops to buy either a crystal deck or an Omni Deck. Then you've got three more tutorials of how to do the Omni Deck. And then you've got a uh, you've got a link through to Amazon on how to buy the Omni Deck. Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make here is any trick that you perform, if people want to find the secret bad enough, 
They can find it. Yeah, you do a trick with UV ink. If somebody types in, you know, how to make ink disappear with a UV light, they will probably come up with a link through to Lux. But if you're constantly having your spectators Googling how to do the tricks that you're doing, then you're doing something wrong. Without being funny, you are doing something wrong. When I perform anything, my audience aren't thinking, right, I'm going to figure out how that's done. They're just having a good time. They're laughing. They're enjoying themselves. They don't think about Googling anything because they're just, and, and also I don't make it challenging. I'm not there saying, oh, this is real magic. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fool you, dickhead. It's none of that. I'm making it entertaining. I'm making it fun. And I'm not pretending that it's real so that people just lose themselves in the moment and don't try and Google how the trick's done. Because frankly, if your performance is causing people to Google how the trick is done every single time, it doesn't matter whether it's looks, it doesn't matter whether it's an ambitious card, it doesn't matter whether it's a stage illusion or anything, anything at all, they are ultimately going to find the answer. So focus more on your performing character, focus more on you as a performer, and focus more about getting people to worry about that sort of stuff, if that makes sense. That's ultimately what you need to do. So yeah, do I think it's an issue that Lux is uh, Googleable? No, because every single magic trick that you can perform close up is Googleable. So the next question is from the Bond villain, and the Bond villain says, thanks for asking, answering my questions, you're more than welcome. Um, I have social anxiety that causes me to have extremely sweaty hands. Okay. I have tried classic palming a coin, but eight out of ten times it slips off my hand. Can you recommend an alternative handling or alternative coin vanishes for sweaty palms like mine? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of uh, coin vanishes that don't use classic palm. Now, uh, this is where I say you should go onto the net tricks, man, because in the slight section, there's like 20 coin vanishes, and I think only four of them use classic palm, but some of them off the top of my head. Um, there's nothing wrong with the French drop. French drop is absolutely amazing. You know, French drop, whether you do it that way or you do it that way, doesn't use classic palm, it uses a finger palm. Um, so there's no worry there about, about, uh, about, um, about classic palm because it's not even going into classic palm. Also, if you don't like finger palm, thumb palm. Just do like a throw thing and end up with it in thumb palm. That works really well as well. Um, and talking about thumb palm, you can just do a steal if you don't if you want to. So you could do like a Vernon steal, and you could steal the coin away. It does the same thing really as a as a as a, as a coin vanish, but you're stealing the coin out instead of holding it back in the other hand. Uh, my favorite one to do is the Vernon steal, and again, it just uses thumb palm. And from there, you can load it back in and you can do an appearance. Um, if you do like finger palm, then you can do, uh, you can just do a finger palm vanish and you can put a little bit of a retention on it as well. So you can show the coin and, and, and really make it look like it's going into the hand. That's uh, a really nice thing to do as well. So that's just using finger palm. Uh, if you don't want to, you know, himba vanish is a nice one as well. Himba vanish is a good vanish. I love the himba vanish. Uh, and again, the Himba Vanish does not use a classic palm at all. The Slide Vanish does not use a classic palm. It literally just slides down the hand. That's a great one to do. Um, and, and then if you're wanting to do it up here, uh, just drop the coin into finger palm. Literally, you're holding the coin here. Just allow it to drop into finger palm as you apparently take it in this hand. And you can do it from this angle and you can really kind of get a retention. Talking about a retention, you know, a retention pass doesn't use... Classic palm, you know, I've, I've just taken that into finger palm. So I've done the uh, the retention pass, there it is, going into finger palm. Or you can do a fingertip retention pass like that, or really kind of just get it at the tips of the fingers and have it go like that. That went into a nowhere palm, that one did. I mean, you could go into nowhere palm, it doesn't have to be a classic palm. So uh, a retention pass is another one, good one to do. When you're talking about retention passes, look at David uh, David Michael Rubenstein's Rops move, which is another type of steel where you put the coin in the hand and then in the action of showing it, you steal it out. So the ROPS move, which is, stands for retention, open palm steal. That's a really good one as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many, really. I mean, if your edge grip isn't uh, a classic palm, so you could kind of do edge grip if you wanted to uh, and shift that into a thumb palm ready for the appearance. Uh, and from that, you know, this is Ben Williams' uh, 
vanish, which allows you to take it directly into a uh, JW grip. That's another palm that you can use that doesn't require classic palm. There's millions more of them, but you get the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is there's lots of ways of vanishing a coin that do not require classic palm. I see a lot of people saying that the reason they don't do coin magic is because they're scared of classic palm. Well, one thing that I try to uh, spend time with my students on in, in Netrix is you don't need to do classic palm. You know, I'm working with somebody in the Netrix at the moment specifically on coin magic. It's a gold level and every week we're having coin magic sessions. And um, he thought you have to use classic palm. And that's absolutely not the case. And we've been working on various different routines that just use finger palm. And, uh, you know, he's becoming really good at coin magic. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, I'm not going to expand any more on them uh, on YouTube, but I mean, you know, without being funny, go into the Netrix, try it out for a month, go and just uh, go into the slight section, go into the coin vanishes section. There's a ton of stuff on there. You can binge all of that. Okay. So the next question is from Torgini and Torgini says, where can you find Daryl's ring and rope routine? Which is what I referenced the other day. Uh, I've just done a quick Google and the first link that comes up is Penguin. Penguin have got Daryl's rope routine, which includes the ring and rope routine as an instant download for $19.95, $19.95. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other places that you can get it from as well. Um, but Penguin have it there right now. So yeah, you want to learn it? Learn it from uh, Penguin. Get the instant download. It's $19.99. The next question is from Harry Vagrant, and I think we've got another uh, Drunk Magic ukulele player here because he says, Hi Craig, it's about time you started on your channel a hair off, not a beard off. Too many magicians with beards, but who has the longest and wildest golden mane? You spoke of a magician a few weeks ago who had hair to be loud and proud of. So I would like to put myself forward as a candidate, as the magician, and 60 years old, I have hair to be reckoned with. So what do you think? Is the magic community ready for a hair off? Well, I think if we're going to have a hair off and you were in it, we'd have to have a three-way between uh, who else would be in a hair off? I think you'd have to throw, um, I think you'd have to throw Lysander in there. Lysander would have to be in there. He's got that beautiful mane of hair. Um, and also, uh, you know, I'd say mullet Harlan. I'm not talking about modern day Harlan. I'm talking about mullet Harlan. He had hair to be proud of. But you know, the, the, the greatest hair in the whole of magic, and I'm sorry, Anybody else will. You know, like if you compete against Shin Lim when it comes to sleight of hand with cards, you're going to lose, right? Anybody who's trying to compete when it comes to hair will lose to Nick LaCoppa. He has, he has the best hair in magic. Nobody even comes close. It literally has a life of its own. I think if Nick ever decided to do a kid's show, he could have the hair as a puppet. Just sitting there, talking on its head because he's got a life of his own. Nick's hair is unbeatable in my opinion. Next question is from Rob Magic 101. Great meeting you at Wessex Magic Convention. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any tips for performing on a river cruise? No. No, I don't. I literally have no tips at all. I've done a few gigs, corporate gigs on the, on the Thames uh, when I was, about, I just did my normal stuff, you know, I just did my normal, I suppose if I had one tip for performing on a river cruise, it would be, don't be standing on deck and doing tricks with a borrowed ring, because that would end very, very badly, in fact, I wouldn't want to do coin magic, I wouldn't want to pull out my, my Morgan dollars, give them to a spectator and have them drop them when I'm going on a river cruise, right, I suppose, stick to the playing cards, uh, but no, I mean, I haven't really got any tips, I, I, every time I've found myself either on a cruise or uh, a river cruise and I as I say I have done it a few times on the Thames anytime I found myself in that situation I've just done my normal stuff it's not like you have to create special river themed tricks for people that are on a river cruise so there's not really any tips I can give you just do your normal stuff just go out there and do your normal stuff but maybe anything that's valuable if you're standing on deck be careful not to have it roll off deck especially a borrowed ring Okay, we got another question from Sean McNulty, Magician, and Sean says, what other slights are there to do the stab coincidence when the card gets put in the deck and go be goes beside the selected card? Well, I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, I'll give you a couple of ideas that you can use right now. So the first is just to pick up a double and have them, um, you know, just pick a couple of different ways. You could either pick up a double, so you, hide, you, you know, you're taking a joker out, for example, and then you take out a double, so you're taking the card that you want to force. In this case, it's uh, six of diamonds, which Ryland has signed. 
you know, so you have uh, you have the double and you riffle down the deck and you have them say stop and you put the card in at that point. And as you uh, as you pull it out halfway, you've loaded the uh, the bottom card of the double there. So that when you flip that card over, it's the card that you want to force. OK, so in full speed. That's my favorite way of doing it, to be honest, because it looks so fair, doesn't it? Really, when you think about it, it's like just say stop, stop. Are you sure you want to stop right now? We'll put this in here right where you said stop. Let's have a look at the card that you stopped at and boom. Now you can actually do that if you want to with them holding onto the deck. So you can just take a double and you can have them spread the deck out. So they spread the deck out in your hands and you just grab the double and you do exactly the same thing, but with them holding onto the cards. So, but this time you just push it all the way in and you then take the cards back off them and you say, let's have a look at where I put it next to. So it's, it's you know, you can do it both ways. You can either have them spread it out and you put it in um, or you can, you know, you can just riffle down and put it in for them. If you want them to put it in themselves, uh, again, there's a couple of different options. Uh, so let's just say that the card is the seven of spades. So the first option is you could use a cull. So they could put the card in themselves somewhere into the middle. And as you say, look, do you want the card above or below it? And if they say above it, you just load the cold card to above the jo joker. And if they say below, you load to below the joker. So now uh, the one above, because they said above there, is the seven of spades. So in that action, and you'd want to try and get it to the fifth position. So maybe you control it to the top and then you just uh, you just shuffle four cards off and you know give it a full shuffle or something. But it's the action of they take it, they push it into the middle and you've got all the reason in the, uh, the world uh, you know, to spread through. Do you want it underneath this time? Yeah, you want it underneath. Okay, right there. So uh, let's just take the card out there. And uh, boom, there it is, the seven of spades. Um, the other option is obviously to do the, uh, the prophecy move, uh, which is a very underutilized move that a lot of people don't do, but it would position either the top or the bottom card next to the joker. Um, so you give them the joker. You just have to have a reason for turning that card over. So for example, you might say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a card. Um, let's say I wanted to force the seven of spades and the four of diamonds. You say, look, I'm going to take a card out of the deck. Uh, we're not going to look at it right now. Do you want to put it somewhere into the deck yourself? And so they put it somewhere into the middle and you say, you're happy putting it there. Yeah. Do you know what this card is? And they say, no. And you say, let's have a look at it. It's the Joker. Okay. Now you put it next to two cards, uh, one above, one below. We'll take those two cards out. And obviously in that action, you've got the, uh, the two force cards, the seven of spades and the four of diamonds. So the prophecy move is a great way to do that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it really. I mean, those are the, uh, the only other way I can think of is by doing, uh, if you're wanting to make it look like you're just throwing it in at random, um, you could, you could have a breather crimped card. So literally, uh, uh, take a card and breather crimp it, right? And have that on the bottom of the deck. Um, so you take a card out, you give them the cards to shuffle, so they shuffle the cards, and you could then just throw that card into the deck and make it look like you've randomly thrown it in somewhere, and then obviously you've thrown it right next to the six of spades. The advantage of that is they could shuffle the cards. So they could literally shuffle the cards, your back could be turned, nothing could happen. The disadvantage is you're uh, throwing it into the deck yourself, but because they've shuffled, it feels very, very fair, and yet you've still got the Six of Diamonds. So that's, uh, that's a nice way of doing it as well. And, you know, there's various different ways of using a breather crimp to do that. But uh, there's five different ways of doing what you want to achieve. So hopefully that one of those will work for you. Okay, so the next question, and several people have asked this question, but the first one that's popped up is from Gert Sang, uh, Jean Sangrien, saying, looking forward to the Memjack project. Thank you very much. It is now, it's not in the moment, because I'm filming this in the middle of the week, but it goes live on Friday on Murphy's, which means when you see this on Sunday, it will be live on Murphy's. So if you, if you, uh, if you want to buy it, it's, uh, it's called Forecast. It's, uh, it's available for pre-order. Uh, through Murphy's. I'm very, very excited about it. It's another one of my super long projects. So it's five hours long. It comes with the gimmicks that you need to be able to memorize the deck in real time. And the price is ridiculous. When you consider it's a five hour project with gimmicks, I think the price is like 25 bucks, something like that. It's like, tell me another project that comes with gimmicks, five hours, 11, 10 routines for 25 bucks and at least 50% of the routines, even though it's a collection of routines with a mem deck, 
at least 50% of the routines, you don't even need to know the stack at all. You don't even need to know the stack. So, you know, what's not to love? So there you go. Uh, if you like it and you're looking forward to it, you can pre-order it right now on Penguin. And the final question is from Kingmaker101. And Kingmaker101 says, um, do you really believe that uh, Lux is the trick of the decade? Yes, I do. I've been working with Lux for four months now. Um, you know, like I love Lux. My audiences love Lux. There's so much that I do with Lux. And I absolutely love it. And I've, I know people have commented on the channel going, what about the cups and balls? Well, I do the cups and balls. I love the cups and balls. But in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, this is the best thing that's come out in the last decade because the opportunities are just ridiculous. The stuff you can do with this is ridiculous. It baffles the brain that there have been people that have been negative about it when they haven't even owned it. They don't own one, they haven't seen one, they haven't watched the tutorial, they don't know all of the, uh, what it involves or how easy it is to switch between modes, they don't know anything. They're just basing this on what they've heard and what they've read on various different forums. I found it hilarious that there's some people on Facebook going, oh, this is a very deceptive trailer. This is, a, what? This is, the most, this is the most honest trailer I've ever seen. First of all, the trailer gives away exactly what it is. And then Lloyd did a two hour video explaining exactly what it is and breaking down everything. I think you get, you can see exactly what it is and you can make the decision whether you wanna buy it or not. I think they've been very transparent, pardon the pun. Uh, but yeah, do I think it's the best trick in the last decade? Yeah, do I think that there's something that's gonna come along at some point and beat this? Maybe, but right now I'm in a position where I know a lot of the stuff that's coming out from different creators and different producers. I know a lot of stuff that's coming out and I can't see anything that's going to touch this coming out in any time soon. It's brilliant. It's the trick of the decade. So there you go, guys. That's another, uh, that's a, that's another Q&A in the bag. Thank you very much once again for joining me right here on Magic TV on a Sunday lunchtime. I really appreciate it. You want to see more videos like this? You know what you got to do. you got to like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. For every single person that said, hey, I want to support you. How can I do that? Please sign up to the Netflix and try it out for a month. It's only £14.99 at bronze level, £29.99 at silver level, and you get access to the Virtual Magic Club. And we're having a blast doing stuff every single week on the Virtual Magic Club. If you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. If you want to support me, that's the way to do it. Either way, I'll be back again very, very soon with another two video, three videos today. I've got one at two o'clock, uh, which is going to be a short. So at six o'clock, I've got a live. At nine o'clock, I'm going to be back with a special review show special, and it's all on Steve Rowe Magic. Lots of fun stuff coming up this Sunday. Whatever you end up doing today, have an amazing day. I'll see you again soon. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.